Isaiah chapter 9, pretty close to the middle of the Bible, verses 1 through 7. But there'll be no gloom or no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak roiled or rolled in blood will be burning for burning fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government, government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, bless our time as we come before you, Lord. We thank you that we can enter into your presence with your people, Lord. We know it is your pleasure to dwell with your people, especially as we gather as a body. Father, lead us into repentance and into new life and give us hope in your promises, which never fail. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So much of enjoyment is tied to anticipation. Anticipation is excitement that builds from waiting eagerly for something you know is going to happen. Probably one of the most ready examples is a groom finally seeing his bride walk down the aisle on her, you know, in her glorious dress on the wedding day. Uh, and some of you uh, are single, so you can't relate yet. So here's an example I thought of when I was thinking about anticipation. Taking your shoes and socks off after a long day of work on hard ground. And earlier this year, it was like a million degrees outside. I felt like I was back in the south again. And I was wearing mudding boots, is what we call them, those rubber cheap boots you can buy. And uh, I have to wear socks in them, otherwise it wears your feet down. So I got socks on, the rubber boots on. It's like 90 degrees outside. I'm moving things all around the farm. And uh, and my feet are just like sore. And I remember looking forward to coming inside and taking it off. So you take your boots off, you take the socks off, and the air goes between your toes. And you're just, it feels awesome, right? The anticipation of uh, a relief is especially powerful. I broke my jaw wrestling back in high school. I got a bunch of fake teeth and snapped it right up the middle. And then I tried to wrestle again before it was healed and the heavyweight broke it again. Uh, So I've got some jaw problems going on up here. And every so often it gets disjointed, right? You put your hand here and I can make it pop for you. And once it popped and it did not go back, and that was when we first moved here, and it just hurt to chew, to talk, um, which is mostly what I do. I talk for a living. I belong to the chatter class, right? Preachers and salesmen. And uh, so uh, my, my normal chiropractor was away on vacation, uh, and so I went to this other guy who has an ironic name, uh, but I won't say it. So I went in there to have him snap it back in place. And he does all, all the woo-woo stuff that chiropractors do, you know, tap, 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 tap. And you're like, there's no way this is real. And then you stand up and you can move different. And you're like, well, maybe it's psychosomatic, but it works, like whatever. Um, well, so he, he moves my jaw around and uh, it, there's no relief right? It actually still hurts. And he says what every homeopathic person ever says, right? Oh, it it always gets worse before it gets better. Well, that's, that's like true of most, most sicknesses I've experienced my entire life. So I'm like, you sure, man, it feels kind of the same. Oh, it'll be better in a couple days. So it doesn't get better at all. It gets worse. It hurts so bad. And finally, my chiropractor comes back from enjoying himself and uh, Dr. Jack Hendricks. So I go in and uh, Jack steps up on that goofy little table they have, puts me in a headlock, right? And he goes like this, right, real hard. And you hear it go pop. And it went all back in place and immediately, 
immediately, the, the, that ringing pain. You ever had sci- sciatic nerve damage or something like that? That pain that's just been throbbing just went away. And I was like, oh, right? The relief was, was wonderful. I remember looking forward to it like for two weeks just to go see this guy because I knew he would actually fix it. And um, anyhow, Proverbs 13.2, what it says is hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. The first um, springing of hope is pleasurable, a pleasurable sensation, not unmixed with pain. It is the hunger, this is uh, Charles Bridges, that makes our food acceptable. But hope deferred, like hunger prolonged, brings a kind of torture and makes the heart sick. Yet when the desire, the fulfillment of that hope comes, what a tree of life it is, so reviving, so invigorating. So once I got there, Jack popped it in, and it felt good. It was better than anything I could think of. Now, what does that have to do with Advent, Christmas, or even Isaiah 9? Let me explain, but a little background first. The historical and political context of Isaiah is pretty complicated. Uh, So this is very much a simplification. Uh, But Isaiah is prophesying during a time in which the Assyrians are a growing mounting threat to the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, To protect themselves, some of the Israelites suggest, let's make uh, an alliance with Egypt. And then others say, we should just make a deal with the Assyrians, they're right here. And uh, so that's kind of a, a, a debate that's happening in Israel. And Isaiah, on the command of the Lord, told them that they should do neither. Instead, they should turn from their false gods and trust in the one true God. Their issue, and this point comes up over and over again in Isaiah, wasn't a strategic deficiency. It was moral and spiritual apostasy. Right? They had turned from God. If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? Nobody. But they refused to trust God. They eventually make a deal with the Assyrians. It backfires. The Assyrians sack the entire northern kingdom. Uh, they carry all the people away. And they resettle uh, the land where they came from with immigrants from other nations. So Isaiah is a future prophecy of coming judgments, but also of prophecies of, uh, of the hope of redemption. So it's rich and messianic prophecies, like the one we find in the chapter we're looking at today. This chapter exists for those under the pain of judgment. They're wondering, is there any relief out there? Is there hope? Is there something to look forward to? And in Isaiah 9, we get this answer, yes. And in doing so, it creates a powerful anticipation. Verse 1 says, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So Zebulon and Naphtali had been among the tribes who first suffered when the Assyrians invaded uh, the, the north, right? So they felt the full vigor of that. So they, when they came in, they were like chomping the bit to go at it hard, and they did. So consequently, these people, they've been experiencing gloom and anguish longer than anyone in the northern uh, kingdom. Now, gloom is the, like a cloudiness or a heaviness of mind that comes from the darkness of, of prospect. So gloom is when you look into the future and you see none. Gloom is when there is just no hope. You see no way out. It's the loss of hope. You can't see anything good. And it's a mentality. It's a way of thinking. Anguish, on the other hand, means extreme pain of body or spirit. It's weird. Where one starts and the other one ends, I don't know. Like when we talk about things like depression, like depression, without a doubt, is spiritual, right? Like a lot of times, we're depressed because we commit some sort of sin and we, f- we refuse to repent of it. That creates guilt. That drives us to usually self-medicate some way, right? Through food or watching Netflix like nonstop or drinking alcohol or abusing drugs, whatever. And then that becomes a physical problem. Or sometimes let's say you can't do your job anymore. You hurt, like you hurt your back and you can't work. And then your whole identity was, uh, as it is with most of us, caught up in your work. And now since you can't work, you feel like you have no value and you get depressed. Like one starts in the body and ends in the spirit, another in the spirit, in the body, whatever. There's a connection there. But nonetheless, pain both of the mind and the body is very real. And this is anguish. It's that throbbing pain that won't go away, right? Like a cloud setting over you. 
gloom and anguish. So Zebulon and Naphtali was a gloomy land, but not for long. Isaiah says God will make Galilee of the Gentiles glorious. It's called Galilee of the Gentiles because it's exactly where a lot of these uh, foreigners were first settled by the Assyrians. So after they took everyone away and they brought people from other lands, they did that so it was hard for people to come back and, and revolt against them. They're always kind of mixing them up. And they came right back there in that Galilean region. So it's the last place that you would think the, the Messiah would come from. And yet, in verse 2 it says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. I like the scripture says there's such thing as a dark land, right? I've avo- I avoid that phrase, Christian nationalist, because it just gets everyone upset. And who knows what people mean by it, right? But people act like lands can't have a spiritual demeanor to them. What are you talking about? We have all been to places where you're like, this place is dark. There is something not here. And then we've been to places, when we're, especially when we're worshiping with God's people, in the joy, right? The thanksgiving, the gratitude, the peace in that place, you feel it. There are dark lands. You've all been to them. This was a dark land. Now, we know exactly what this means because the gospel of Matthew spells it out for us. Listen to Matthew 4, 12 through 17. Now, when he had heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, Jesus withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali. So what, so what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulon the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus is that great light. John 8 says, or Jesus says in John 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus sheds his light on the world by preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So we see right there, he's the light. And from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is a kingdom that will expand and spread into the entire world. We're evidence of that this very morning, aren't we? That's how we know the greatness of the gospel, the greatness of the kingdom, because here we are. You remember where this started? Far away, far away, over a whole other ocean, in another language, long ago. Yet we are praising Jesus today and belong to his kingdom. You see this right here in Isaiah? Look at verse 3. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Do you remember God's promise to Abraham, or Abram? Genesis 12, one through two reads, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And again, hang on here. And again, in Genesis 15, God brought Abram outside and said, look towards heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to them, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. So God gave this wonderful promise to Abram that he would become Abraham right, a father of many nations, of a nation in particular. Now, what nation? Well, it's fulfilled in Christ. Galatians 3.29 spells it out. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise, promise of salvation by faith, right? All the promises caught up uh, throughout the Old Testament, fulfilled in Christ. Romans 4 makes it clear that whoever also walks in the footstep footsteps of the faith of Abraham has him as father. 
And then all these ideas get weaved together in 1 Peter 2, 9, where Peter tells Christians that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. One reason you should read the Old Testament is because God tells you to, right? And that's the first one. The second reason is the New Testament is so rich. It pulls all these threads together. There's so many passages alluded to in every single verse of the New Testament. And that people just make time in this new year to go through the whole Old Testament. It's amazing. Now, Jesus, the light of the world, came into this dark world to redeem a people and make them into a holy nation. That's what we are. He uh, multiplies the nation to the preaching of the gospel. It's always growing. I think about this where I, I think about history in like hundreds and thousands of years. Decades don't really mean anything to me anymore. Not just because I'm getting a little bit older, but I've read enough church history to see how things take a while to play out. And when I look at history, what I see is a unstoppable army on march. How could you see anything else? Rome came and it went. The Syrians came and they went. Right? This kingdom, that kingdom, they all came and they went. Like the church just keeps on spreading. There's Christians almost like there's Christians on every continent. Right? If they're not living on Antarctica right now, guarding the ice wall to keep us from falling off the edge of the earth, um, <laughs> they've been there, right? They've been there. And uh, yeah, they're, we've spread all over the earth. That's the power of the gospel. It's unstoppable. It's always multiplying. It says uh, that we will be glad in your presence, or they will be glad in your presence, that is the meaning of Emmanuel. God is with us. I think about gladness and joy a whole lot just because when I find the most orthodox Christians that know the most theology, it is odd how few of them are full of joy. Right? And I don't, don't know what to make of that other than that uh, they, you can have the theology of scripture, but not the reality of it. The theology of Paul, but not his reality. How can you love Jesus and not be full of gladness, not be full of joy? Now, if that's your case, there's dark valleys, there's dark lands. You can go in dark places. But as you look to Jesus and you think that God is with me, I'm in his presence. There's a lot of gladness that comes from that. And Jesus Uh, we read what this means in Luke 2. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Jesus coming into the world is a source of gladness. Isaiah gives these uh, two metaphors to explain the quality of that gladness. He says, As with the gladness of harvest... As men rejoice when they divide the spoil. And I thought Matthew Henry, um, by the way, when you read Matthew Henry's commentary, so if you're looking for a good commentary just as you study the Bible um, and and you're too lazy to buy books, or you know you just won't read books if you buy them, uh, you can just type in Matthew Henry and then Romans 1, Matthew, whatever. And he's he's usually pretty good, but there's the concise version. And then there's the, uh, the full version. Always read the full version. That's what the cons- anytime you read modern abridgments, they take all the good stuff out, right? Anytime it says, like there's this book, uh, uh, Spiritual Leadership by J. Oswald Sanders, and it said it had been edited uh, because it had some old ideas in it. Well, old ideas like women can't be pastors. So they had to correct that. And so yeah, I want to know, what did you take out? Why? You know, it's like when you watch uh, E.T. and now they don't have guns anymore. They're like goofy walkie-talkies. Like, I want to know what people take out. So read the full version of Matthew Henry. And this comes from, and I thought this was really helpful. It is a great joy 
It is according to the joy in harvest when those who sowed in tears and have with long patience waited for the precious fruits of the earth reap in joy as in war men rejoice when after a hazardous battle they divide the spoil. The gospel brings with it plenty and victory, but those that would have the joy of it must expect to go through a hard work as a husbandman before he has the joy of the harvest and a hard conflict as a soldier before he has the joy of dividing the spoil. But the joy, when it comes, will be abundant recompense for the toil. I thought that was powerful. I thought that was helpful. Just as Israel had to wait for Jesus' first coming, the promise of fulfillment of a, a lot of this. So we must be, uh, so we must wait to be reunited with the Lord, either A, at death, or B, his second coming. We are still waiting for the fullness of the harvest and the completeness of the victory at the end of the age. We, we get to taste some of the fruit of the harvest right now. We get some of the spoils of war right now, but the fullness isn't here yet. So one thing we need to remember is what Paul told the church Back in Acts 14, Paul went about strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Many. The gospel does not promise a life absent of hardship. It will be hard. Quite the opposite. It's a difficult life. The way of the world, generally speaking, is the easy way, at least on the front end, it makes promises that it cannot keep. The gospel promises difficulty up front, but glory, salvation, and pleasure in the end. Again, yes, you get to taste uh, a little along the way, but the fullness comes later. Our present culture likes to promise you a shortcut to the good life. And I always think of shortcuts at, at best are detours, but generally they are dead ends right? They never deliver. You always think, I mean, maybe you've done this in real life. I remember when I had to get out paper maps before we had, um, you know, MapQuest and now Google Maps and whatever. But I remember like, this, is, this way will save us so much time. And then you just end up like having to drive all the way back, right? Or if you're stuck in a parking lot, you're like, I'm going to go around the back side of the building to get out. And then there's like a big wall for no stinking reason. And you're like, I guess I'm going to go back. And now you're at further back in the line than where you had been. That's how most shortcuts work out. And the world says, here's how you can skip difficulty, right? Here's how we can grease the wheels, and make it a little easy. You don't have to deal with your sin problem, right? We, we want to be positive and uplifting and encouraging and all that stuff, right? Um, so you don't have to do that. And it's going to show you these shortcuts. And but what you find is it's like that carrot, like that the donkeys, whatever, are always trying to get that keeps them moving, but it never gets a hold of it. And I think about it's one thing to experience disaster at the beginning of life, right, on your way to first base. It's a whole other thing when you're rounding third and heading for home. And how many people, like for a long time, look like they're winning. And you thought, wow, you know, why, why do the wicked prosper? Like I, I've, I'm serving the Lord and life is hard scrabble. And this person, like he's on a second marriage and he's greedy and he's cocky. And, but he looks like he's so happy. You know, everyone on Instagram looks happy. You know, I really think there should at least be one day of the year where all your profile pics get turned to your worst driving license picture ever, right? This one day of the year, like, this is what I really look like. You know, this is how I really feel. Um, but uh, they look so happy, and then these things catch up with them. Yeah, I love entrepreneurship. I love studying that stuff. And I think of, oh, I can't think of her name right now. You all will be able to tell me. But she's a girl that tried to look like Steve Jobs and wore a black sweater, a sweater and talked in a weird, deep voice and had this blood, this new way of taking blood that's going to be amazing. Theranos, Theranos, I can't think what it is. Anyway, it was all fake. And she was like the biggest deal for a time. It all came tumbling down. It all came. That is the promises of the world. It, they actually do feel good. Sin feels good for a little bit. People always tell people sin doesn't feel good. Well, why do they do it so much? Because they're a sinner. Yeah, and it feels good for a while. But then it catches you, right? It catches you. So the world's always promising these things. What scripture says 
is that no, there's good things to come, but you must enter through many tribulations. There will be suffering. That's why overly triumphant promises of immediate victory are dangerous. Remember, hope deferred makes the heart sick. So if these big promises are not immediately realized, they usually dishearten and disorientate, which is why you find out that so many bitter old men were once hopeful young men, deluded by some worldly promise of immediate victory. That's what you find out. And I, uh, I've had the privilege, if you want to call it that, of going through two like little movements, the emerging church, which then was called the emergent church. By the time it was called the emergent church, it was already not cool. So if someone called it the emergent church, you knew they were old fuddy-duddy. Um, and then there's a new Calvinism movement. And I was thinking about this this morning where for a while it was like really cool to drink dark beer. You couldn't drink light beer, but you had to drink dark beer. I think I still agree with that. Um, and then you're really into MMA and you had to talk, you know, that, and then you'd always mention how your wife was smoking hot. Okay. Now you are allowed to believe that about your wife. I sure hope you do. But when you say that to me, what am I supposed to say back? Like, uh, high five, brother? I mean, like, like, am I supposed to look and like try to decide if I, had a, I don't know where to take this thing. But I remember in New Calvinism, it was all about that sort of stuff. And I remember thinking, man, this is probably going to look goofy in the future, isn't it? It's going to look really silly. And there's all these movements that come through. This is the new type of Christianity. This is the better iteration. Now we got it. Now's the time, right? Triumphant. We're moving forward. We're taking all that. And, uh, and I believe in that stuff. I just have found that it works in centuries, in centuries, and not quite in the years and months that a lot of people hope. And when they put their hope on that immediate sense of victory and it doesn't happen, they get disillusioned. It happens over and over again. And that's why we have to be very careful what we, hedge, or what we wage our bets on. You want to put it all on black, so to speak? Well, that's Jesus. It's on these promises, bet on these. Because big promises gather big crowds, but if they're not biblical promises, they eventually fall short and produce a large number of cynical malcontents. This in turn produces a manic depressive cycle that swings back and forth. We are winning and we can't be stopped to we can't win. Big talkers come and go and they leave a trail of destruction in their wake. Think about that. That's what the Jews figured was going on with the early church. They just figured it's more big talkers. In Acts 5, the apostles refused to stop preaching the gospel, uh, even though the Jews said, you got to stop. And they're like, no, we don't. God told us to. You got to obey God rather than men, right? So verse 33 of chapter 5, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, uh, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody, I love that, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census, led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in, this, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. He was right. Because God makes and keeps promises. You can't fight against them. It's sure than gravity. When God makes a promise in scripture, think of it like you think of gravity. It's just a law. It's going to happen. You can count on it. You're sure of it. God is a warrior. Verses four and five it says, for you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors as the battle of Midian, for every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult, cloak rolled in blood will be for burning for fuel for the fire. So the idea here is that <clears throat> uh, burning the boots and the cloaks, everything's gone. 
right? You've taken all the spoils, and now you're just going to use all their clothing to, to get your campfires going. It's going to be fuel. It's total and complete victory. And that is exactly what Jesus accomplished in his life on the cross through the resurrection and in his ascension and will finish in his second coming. His yoke is indeed easy. His burden is light. And there is no one that has a rod on our neck other than the Lord and uses it to keep us for good. He is our good shepherd. He is our victorious Warrior king, the Lord is a warrior. And a day is coming when every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. We wait in anticipation for a day, that day, like a child staring at the gifts under the Christmas tree. I think it's lame to put gifts, uh, the gifts uh, out like a day before Christmas. So if you're doing that, I'm sorry. But it is also lame, okay? Um, the reason it's lame is you, you look and there's these boxes. You don't know what's in there. And they have your name on them. When someone went through all that trouble, boxed it all up and put your name, they belong to you. The, the, the gift, everything that's in there, which you don't fully understand, they are yours. You just got to wait, right? And that anticipation, you know, like Christmas means no matter when you normally get up, you're getting up at 5 a.m., right? Like kids jumping on your bed, waking you up. And so I'm not even a Christian yet, right? Give me a couple more hours. Um, so even though you may not have full possession of those gifts, they belong to you, right? All the gospel promises, all in the Old Testament, they are ours. They are promised to us. And that's what we're looking forward to. As they look forward to the first coming, which happened exactly as he said it would. So we look forward to the second coming, which will happen exactly as he said it would. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the promise of a prince who has come, and he is our king, he is our Lord, he is our redeemer and savior. We thank you that he is the king of all kings. We have nothing to fear. There is no gloom, there is no anguish. Yes, there is tribulation and trial, but we're strengthened, Lord, because we see off in the distance hope, the hope of being resurrected, the finality of, of glorification, the fullness of that new life, and a day when the warrior King Jesus will set everything right here on earth, God. Lord, we pray that would be the greatest gift that we give each other, give our children, which is the reminder that you are a God who makes and keeps promises. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.